I think professionalism and disclosure of conflicts is a sales advantage. If you're doing that and a competitor for the client is not, don't you see more credible? I think it's a sales advantage as well as a way to lessen your risk. Hi, I'm Chris Reynolds, and I'm on a mission to help independent financial advisors build a better business through a remarkable client experience. In this podcast, you're going to learn how to do that from my conversations with the visionaries, the leaders, the independent advisors who are reshaping the future of the financial advice industry. At the end of each episode, you're going to walk away with an actionable idea that you can take and use right now, and it will help you to build a better business today. This is Turning the Page. Imagine a scenario where you're building a successful business, growing dramatically, and then bam, the markets decline, clients are unhappy, and a client then takes that unhappiness and then goes to a regulator. Tells them that you've done a terrible job at recommending whatever investments that you've recommended, and they want all their money back. What do you do? It turns a business upside down. Right? And what if they went further and said, not only am I going to the regulars, but I'm actually going to sue you for giving me bad advice and putting me in the wrong direction. What do you do then? Right? They, they, do you have a defense? Do you have a methodology to prove that you did what you said you were going to do and that they agreed to it? Some do, some don't. But I thought this is a great topic. And as a result, I have a fantastic uh, guest on my podcast, which is uh, Harold Geller. Harry Geller is very well known in our industry. Um, and he helps both advisors on the one side with this nightmare, but he also helps clients <laughs> maybe uh, on the other side is as well. So he brings a very good perspective. You know, Harold assists investors, insureds, their lawyers. He looks at claims. Um, he looks at settlement of claims. Um, he's in the civil courts. He works with ombudsman for the banking services and investment. Believe it or not, Harold's actually helped over 1,500 clients recover financial losses from both banks, investment dealers, portfolio managers, life insurance agencies, all over. He's a great speaker. I've read a lot of his articles over the year. I'm a great admirer of his work and, and, and his practical knowledge that he brings to the industry. You know, in other words, he's the guy to go to if you are worried about risk. So Harold, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. This is a great show and you share some really important information, practical information. So thank you. Well, I think we're going to see some, hear some really practical information on this particular show. It's, it's something that, you know, again, a lot of business owners forget in the financial industry, but business owners tend to forget the level of risk sometimes that they take on when making recommendations to clients or providing products to clients or what their obligations are. And as a, the, the, the nightmare that I illustrated at the beginning of the show, it happens. And sitting where I sit, I see it happen all the time and probably more frequently than people believe. So Harold, to, to get started, why don't you tell us your story? How did you get here? How did you become where you are today? And what were the factors involved? Well, like most people, uh, it was somewhat happenstance where how I got into this. I didn't even know about the field 30 years ago when I started on law. But as a child, when I was 16 years old, I wrote the Ontario Securities uh, uh, Courses uh, uh, Standard <laughs> Qualification. And I was qualified, although too young, to be a financial advisor. That's ridiculous because I didn't have any practical experience. I'd never balanced a checkbook. I'd never had a full-time job. I'd never had a mortgage, never had a lease. No, I was not qualified. I passed a test. Right. And um, uh, after that, uh, when I went into legal uh, legal services, um, along the way, uh, somebody from a, a, a service club came up to me and said, Harold, I'm with a big firm um, lawyer, and um, uh, this lawyer has been running this case, and it's cost me $30,000 so far, Holy but more. the claim is for $6,000. <laughs> What's gone wrong? Can you help me? So I had to learn about an in guaranteed impaired annuity. What the heck is that? I so don't I started even know what that interviewing is. people, right? I wanted to learn. And sooner or later, I started talking about errors and emissions uh, on behalf of some insurers. And then I started getting cases. What surprised me was it was often people like yourself who came across a client, a new client, giving a second opinion. And they recognized the client had not been well served. 
Now, it's not for you to start giving legal advice, of course, but right. they wanted somebody to call who was independent, who could give an opinion. So I started. And in doing so, I did two things. First of all, I study to this day all the time. The first hour right. of my day is studying. The second thing is I started doing volunteer work by uh, working with securities commissions, with uh, other regulators, MFDA, IROC, OBSI, uh, in order, FISRA, in order to help improve uh, their understanding of the investors and insurance perspective. But one of my constant advocacy points is those regulators also need to hear from advisors because right. some of this voices for advisors these are big, you know, uh, lobbyists. Um, uh, they don't really speak for advisors. They speak for the companies that Correct. Yeah. represent advisors. And really your input, the advisors in the trenches um, perspective must be heard by regulators. What you get is unintentional red tape that does not reflect the reality of the services provided. So this is partially a call out to all of your audience to get involved, be heard, so that you're not trapped in these useless red tape, impractical procedures as proclamated by academics and regulators. I could not agree more, Harold. You, you said it. <laughs> you said it. A mouthful. I speak for the advisors all the time, and I speak to advisors. And you know, as much as the complaints come, into your point, a lot of it's red tape. A lot of it's not practical. Doesn't make sense. But I'm like, let's band together. Let's get our voice out there. So I'm glad that you are at least one of those advocates that continue to promote. You know, some common sense in that. Now, going da down that path, you know, for context, we started. You know, we we're talking a little bit before the show how how busy you are. You know. What scenario happens a lot that that you know advisors are seeing right now? So what are your what are your clients uh, you know saying? Where where are they coming from? What are the scenarios? And, and this is very important with these examples because then advisor can think, oh wow, I might be in that situation. Uh, what should I be doing? Well, I've just come out of a period where a lot of the complaints were related to insurance products, essentially illustrations at time of sale that had no no to them. You're going to get 10% net every year for the next 80 years on your investments in a UL policy. No, you're not. Right. There's no discussion of sequence of returns and all that sort of stuff. That was what I was seeing a lot of in the uh, last few years. The tides have turned. And as B Buffett said, when the tide goes out, you see who's not wearing a bathing suit. <laughs> My favorite quote. Well, we're most certainly seeing it. And we're seeing it on stuff that the dealers should have had your back. They should have been catching and stopping. And these are the types of things that bring down the reputation of the industry for those who are truly professionals. What I'm seeing is a lot of what I call crystal ball guarantees. Mm. Now, an advisor should never give a prediction. What they are is guarantors of the process, the financial planning, the financial advisory process. They are not magicians who can predict like Kreskin can the future. <laughs> no. And so I'm seeing a lot of claims right now about in the uh, hot market of 2020, 2021, promises of outrageous returns and performance by individual uh, companies, sectors, and things like that, and portfolios, which are so out of whack with any practical plan for an individual, all risk all the time. I'm seeing a lot of that right now. Right. But I'm also seeing files where people just haven't documented their work. So you have a loss and you can't show that it was suitable. The uh, advisor can't defend themselves right. other than by saying, no, that's not what happened. Not good enough. No, I, I completely agree. And one of the things that I, I, um, I, I got from you is, you know, the process will set you free. Like what you advocate a lot is, is be a professional. And, and, and what that means as a professional is to your point is document things is have a set process that you do every single time. So maybe you can expand upon that because I, I'm sure that on your side, if you see somebody who has a great process, that's repeatable, you're like, well, not much of a case here. Well, uh, uh, that's exactly right. So um, thank you for asking that. To begin with, let's look at it from the investor's point of view. They knock on your door because somebody's referred them. They've seen some ad. Some element of your marketing plan has worked. Wonderful. What do they know about you? 
generally very little. What do they know about their own needs? Less. <laughs> That's the shocking right, thing. Right, right. And I don't know what it is, but people shy away from looking at their own financial needs, much as if you can visualize it, a horse approaching a jump and then shying away from the jump. They right. know they got to go over it, but they don't want to confront it. That's one of the great skills, one of the great services of financial advisors and planners. So this person knocks on your door. They don't know what you offer. They don't know anything about silos and regulatory limits or proprietary products that you can only offer. They're just looking for financial advice. Right. Under IROC, now Ciro, you have an, uh, uh, an obligation to act in their best interest. Let me talk about this more practically. Right. As a professional you have an obligation to act in their best interest because that's how you grow your business and that's how you protect your assets, your reputation and your own money. So when the client knocks on your door, you better be pretty clear about what your engagement is. Years ago, advocates put out a best practices manual which included a template for an engagement letter. I think it was overly wordy and uh, a complex, uh, written by a wannabe lawyer, perhaps. <laughs> uh, but, but my point is not that that's uh, a bad starting point, because that's an excellent starting point. Document what your relationship's going to be, and then like make it. sure you check in on that and perform it. If it changes, for example, if your client doesn't want to hear about life insurance at the time, you may still want to send them information because that's part of your or normal marketing or because you think it's important to them. Put in your engagement letter. I am not advising you about life insurance, but from time to time, I may send you materials on life insurance for your consideration and education. Okay? So you're right. not taking on a liability that your client's not willing to engage with you on. Discuss, yeah. Absolutely. Now, when you're uh, bringing them on board, there's a whole lot of documents that have to be created. The most important are not the forms which you would submit to the dealer or the application to the insurer. They're the notes that lead to the form. Unequivocally, since 1988, the whole KYC process, know your client, has been the obligation of the advisor, not the client. Right. Okay. So, you better do that process thoroughly and you better record it. Then distill the, the, the notes to your KYC form, your new client application form. Make sure they're accurate. How can you do that? Send a letter to your client. Say, this is what I'm proposing. Note these areas. Um, this is what it understands. Is this what is suitable for you? If not, this is the opportunity for a further conversation. Anytime there are inconsistencies in communications, for example, one of those investment voyager questionnaires, if there are, and any good questionnaire should have, bring out potential in inconsistencies, it's an education opportunity. So for example, if your client is saying that they are looking for 8% returns with right. no risk, <laughs> hmm. not possible yeah none of us can provide now. that yeah okay so what a great opportunity and when you see that opportunity it's an opportunity to make better relationships with your client provide plain language education and document so you protect yourself right okay because the, the after the fact it might be your compliance manager. It might be your branch manager. It may be your MGA. It might be a regulator or it might be a plaintiff's lawyer like me coming and looking. And I'll tell you, if I see really good records that explain what the process was, then I will tell the client about how difficult the case is, about their risks, and how I likely won't take on the case on contingency risk basis, which is how most clients want to take it on. So this show your work element is the difference between potentially getting sued, getting prosecuted by a uh, regulator or not. One other thing about this, and I think it's right. really important. What happens when a client says, 
I don't understand what went on. I lost this money. Well, if you can pull out your notes and sit mm -hmm. down with your client and review with them how you did discuss it, usually that refreshes their memory and they're satisfied. And they're okay with that. Yeah. But if you can't show when you discussed it and can't remind them, then who are they going to believe? Their own recollection right. or what you're now saying? I, I, as I said, and I've seen these, like, as I said, I've been in those business like a long, long time. And to your point, the ones who have, you know, really good records. In fact, what we say document early and document often uh, versus people who are relying on their memory, or did you remember this? Or do you remember that? Very, very difficult to defend. And at some point, as every entrepreneur should know, you're going to have to defend yourself. At some point, there's no way that you can make everyone happy in every situation in every market condition. It's just not really possible. Sometimes the complaints have nothing to do with you having done anything wrong or failed to do something. It's because of a misunderstanding. But if you can't show what you did, that misunderstanding becomes your liability. You might become the insurer. Yeah, very, very, very good point. And it really comes down to the sort of the basis of, you know, not, not just our business, as I said, it is certainly the wealth management business, but it's certainly every business is the first fundamental thing you have to do is know your client, know what they want, know what their circumstances is, what they're trying to accomplish. Because if you don't know that, how are you ever possibly going to make the right recommendation? And so the second part in that, and maybe you can expand upon this for our, our audience is know your product, like know what you're actually recommending to a client. Like I'm, I'm sometimes shocked where I sit, where somebody's like, well, I didn't know it had that kind of risk level. I'm like, well, if you didn't know, who knew? <laughs> like, so maybe you can expand upon that. Like it is one thing to really know your client, but it's also another thing to really know what you're making a recommendation about. And, and this is one of the real challenges that all professionals have, and most certainly in the investment industry. The number of potential investment options are staggering. Um, you can't keep on top of all of them. So what you really have to do is distill down a process for choosing the ones you're going to recommend and keep up to date with it. Right. Now, a KYP, a KYP is not simply relying on your dealer's information. Sometimes some of the dealers, unfortunately, don't do a very good job, particularly if they're bringing the issue to market. Right. The, often what the advisor hears and sees is sell materials as opposed to uh, a really a, 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 an evaluation of both the benefits and the limitations. Right. It's the limitations which the education really needs to be good on. And that's where KYP is very important, not just in the research, the preparation of recommendations, but also in telling the clients the limitations of both the process and the product itself. Right. And you'll guess what I'm going to say, and show your work. And because show your work. Always you show your work. show yeah. that you did it. Now what? Yeah. And let me give you an example. I have a, I have a, I have a series of, uh, of files going against a particular firm and a particular advisor. And where these clients came in with some great recognizable names, banks, insurers, uh, large uh, product companies, uh, moats between them and their competition, great companies. I guess the advisor well, I'm told by an insider that what the advisor started doing was listening to a particular broadcast every day, mm. turned over the accounts and started going on what it might be short term trading momentum. Uh, hard to see what the actual uh, plan was, but they were for no name, high risk, not well researched holdings. Mm. The clients lost a bucket load and now. The claims are in the tens of millions of dollars. Oh now God. think about it. If you got lawsuits in the tens of millions of dollars against you, your ag agreement with your dealer probably says you indemnify the dealer. Exactly. Now have you put all your assets, all of your hopes for your own future on the line? Avoid it. KYP and make records. Yep, this is the best advice. And as I said, this is, uh, although we're applying it in the wealth management business, these are all business, right? Is, is, is these types of things can ruin somebody going off the path and, and, and the process you know, that only leads to trouble. 
another thing that I would find uh, get your sort of perspective on is, are you seeing things in other countries, the U.S. or Europe or any of the regulations in those countries that are making their way to Canada? Or are you seeing any of those best practices from those other areas uh, that should be here? Um, and it's only a matter of time. I'd just like to get your perspective on that. Well, uh, uh, let me first deal with about the regulatory world. Um, uh, clearly, Canada is a laggard compared to the consumer protections, if I'm looking at from that right. to prison, um, in uh, the UK, Australia, even the US. Uh, it's quite surprising, but it's true. We are a laggard in most ways. Um, that being said, one of the great equalizers is, you know, those professionals in the industry are, are, are very alert to what's happening in other countries. And what we're seeing is, cross-border uh, uh, pollination of uh, technology uh, uh, approaches. Um, right now, if you want to be, do a financial plan, you're not doing a made in Canada financial plan, although it may be for a Canadian client and have the specifics necessary for Canadian clients. Um, the plan is now an international process. Right. So too with all of these best practices, all of the technology which can help. Let me give you an example, an insurance life guide where you can compare any insurance policy to competitors. That's completely uh, agnostic as to different companies or different products. And you can compare it in many different countries. Those types of software, that sort of technology is now available to every Canadian advisor and levels the playing field between countries. Mm. So the professionals are as good in Canada as in any country, even if the investor protections are weaker. No, that's uh, that's fantastic. And, and and the other commentary is now you're seeing the the movement of the SROs together. You're seeing, you know, MFDA come together with IROC into uh, Ciro. Um, maybe any comments on that and what uh, if there's any that uh, uh, advisors should be thinking about as a result of that? I think that uh, this is very important, partially because uh, uh, at, at long last, um, the regulators are alert to the fact that people seek financial advice, not mutual fund advice or exactly. insurance advice. They're looking for investments. They're looking for life plans. They're not uh, they don't know about the silos, as I said before. Um, and I think the regulators are trying to work on that. The merger of the MFDA and IROC um, is certainly a step towards that. I think it's, it's a great move. But whenever you have these transitions, there's going to be all sorts of problems. Right. And right. the mutual fund dealers um, are, and the uh, IROC dealers had different ways of dealing with things, partially because at the end, the MFDA was a much more aggressive regulator than the IROC was. Right. So the yeah, mutual fund uh, dealers had to get their act in order more so than I believe the IROC dealers. We're gonna see how that works through. We're also looking at the financial titles legislation, which is being regulated out of FISRA, and of course the uh, insurance, which is being out of uh, FISRA, a relatively new principle-based regulator, a very different approach. The title legislation is uh, more uh, for industry to create a moat that protects um, their own use of titles uh, as against uh, uh, people who are unlicensed. Um, it, it's not really for the consumer. Um, it was uh, originally drafted as for a consumer that changed after lobbying by industry. I think it was against lobby industry's interest. A lot of advisors agree. Nonetheless, that's what it is. On the uh, insurance side, remember that SEG funds are insurance products, UL policies are complex insurance, whole life, um, and right. sorry, insurance and investment products. Um, FISRA is taking a very different approach. And although we have not seen a lot of regulatory decisions out of FISRA, having looked at the policy developments on it, they're very concerned about communications, right. about putting the client first, about declaring conflicts of interest, and face of it, all of us have conflicts of interest. Every time I Everybody. bring up a client, one of my first discussions and a frequent discussion is my conflict of interest. Whether I'm being paid hourly or on a, a contingency like a commission, I'm in a conflict of interest. I have to disclose it. I have to continue to disclose it. That's what advisors should do too. FISRA is going that way. At some point, you can expect the securities regulators to it. Right. Why not get in front of this? Why not be the true professional? Frankly, I think professionalism 
and disclosure of conflicts is a sales advantage. If you're doing that and a competitor for the client is not, don't you see more credible? I think it's a sales advantage as well as a way to lessen your risk. I, I I agree because at the end of the day, what are we selling in 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 this and almost anything? We're selling trust, we're selling integrity. People don't want to take uh, you know financial advice from people who don't you know possess the integrity that they're looking for, or honest or straightforward. Um, so you know these lessons that you've given us today, this has been this has been great. So I have a segment in my show. I don't even share it so that you'll be uh, on the side, meaning excited and and give me your off the cuff answers. But I call it my rapid fire. So I'm going to ask you three questions and i want you to answer with the first thing that comes into your mind the okay. first thing is what are you passionate about what are you most passionate about i'm passionate about helping canadians canadian investors and insurance it really turns my crank i love it what is your most memorable client experience that one experience that you had that you're like wow i really helped this person or it's something that i'll remember forever uh, it's actually dealing with uh, a, a dealer. I, I got, I've got gotten phone calls from a dealer when they've had problems and they recognize that I'm involved saying, how do we address this before litigation? How do we address it before it gets out of hand? How do we lessen the loss? I'm really impressed when industry recognize that they've got a problem and they want to address it. I think that they're good for all of us. I love it. And last thing, how do you want to be remembered? I want to be remembered as a professional. I want to be remembered as somebody who cared about my clients and delivered what I said. I share that with most financial advisors who are also passionate about their profession. I love it. And I think that is how you will be remembered, Harold. So my little rant for uh, for our listeners is, you know, as business owners, you know, risk management has to be forefront. You know, as much as we sometimes think our heart is in the right place and, and we sort of go off the path, you know, process is what saves you. As Harold has talked to us about today, you know, document early, document often, have a consistent process, make sure that you know why you're recommending something to this specific client, that you have a process to really gather that information and make the appropriate recommendations and put your client's best interest first. You know, that's just good business. That's not a legal thing. That's not a regular thing. That's just good business. And I think that's what Harold is trying to tell us all. So Harold, any final uh, words for our audience before I let you go? Yeah, I want to talk about the importance of uh, financial advisors to the Canadian economy, to Canadians. You're among the professions, the professions that are most important to people. In fact, you're probably more important to uh, your clients than their lawyers, than their accountants, and their doctors, except when there's a crisis. Why? Because you're with them from their children's cradle to their grave and beyond. This is a long relationship, an honorable profession where you can make a huge impact to Canadians and your own community. So I applaud you and urge you to continue being professionals. Thank you so much, uh, Harold. Uh, it is a noble profession and I'm glad that we're all uh, participating in it. Uh, once again, Harold Geller, uh, fantastic uh, talk about risk management and what we should do to protect our businesses. Until then, I'll talk to you in our next podcast. Thanks for joining me on Turning the Page. What did you learn from today's episode? If you follow me on LinkedIn, please drop me a comment there. I'd love to chat with you about it over virtual coffee. Send me a message on LinkedIn, or you can do so at our website. The link's in the show notes. I'm Chris Reynolds, and until next time.